Okay, I hit record, and I am here with three amazing editors, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, Valerie, why don't you go first, because you're the first on my screen. <laughs> I'm Valerie Isan, and uh, you can find my website, ValerieIsan.com. I H S A N. That's how you spell Isan. I podcast at the Writer Craft Podcast. I'm a three story method editor. I specialize in story diagnostics and book coaching, um, helping memoirists, especially, write their book. Um, and what else can I say? I am, oh, my uh, new book is coming out on uh, the first. Nice. I don't know when this airs, but <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> it's called You Can't Dance a Lie. So it'll be it's oh, available for pre-order on digital right now, but uh, fiction, yeah. nonfiction. It's a memoir. So nice. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. Congratulations. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> uh Miss Catherine. All right. So I am Miss Catherine, also known as Catherine Hernandez. I am <laughs> Sorry, he's cooking in the background. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, we can't hear him. Okay, you're, cool, you're good cool. to go. Yeah. Um, he's chopping on a board, so it's great. <laughs> um, so I do coaching. I really enjoy coaching for people. I do also do, you know, the three-story method editing, but really interested in doing a lot of coaching and helping people, especially with historical pieces, because fact checking and researching history is like my jam that and medical stuff because medical is just fun and interesting so that's really what I do you can find me at scribes-pen.com on the revision wizards podcast and the writer at work podcast nice I didn't know about the second one yeah it was it was dead in the air for a little bit and then we got it back up again <laughs> okay very cool I'm gonna have to go check that out Ooh. um all right Tom hello I'm Tom Holbrook, and uh, I am a three-story ed method editor, newly minted this year, <laughs> um, but I have been editing for a long time. Uh, my website is holbrookauthorservices.com uh, or more easily, authorhelp.net. We'll get you there. Also, it's being rebuilt right now by the fabulous uh, Sharon Coleman, so um, stay tuned. And uh, I have also, uh, I've written half a dozen novels, and I've also written this book called Write Your Novel, or Royoy Eter Linov on my screen, because it's backwards. Uh, <laughs> it's like, what's he reading? There's probably a technical, there's probably a way to flip my screen, but I'm not that clever. It's flipped um, for us. So. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. we can yeah. see it. Fine. Yeah. It do? Fabulous. I don't know. Zoom is weird. Yeah, moves. What can <laughs> yeah. you do? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, that's me. I like reading books. I like coming on Jeff's podcast. Yeah, I like I like all of you coming on my podcast. Yay. Okay, today <laughs> we're talking about the global seas. So three-story method editing uh, follows the story rubric, which anybody can find at theauthorlife.com under their free tools. And it's uh, the last component the last three components of the story rubric are the three C's, the global choice, or sorry, global conflict, global choices, and global consequence. Um, <laughs> the idea is that you can take the components of a scene and apply them to the entire book and that every story needs these three things, conflict, choice, and consequences so before we get into that too deeply there are a massive amount of plotting tools out there like people i'm i'm actually constantly discovering new ones because people will be like hey can you help me work through my plot i used x thing and i'm like i have never heard of that before and there's a lot of great ones um what's your favorite no you have a favorite you hate them all i hate that i don't i don't plot i pants okay <laughs> <laughs> and I'm falling more and more into pantsing. I used to be like a planter, and it's just going more and more in the opposite direction of I won't even plot anything anymore. I have so wow. many questions for you today, then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. <laughs> so when you say plotting tool, do you mean like Scrivener and plotter? plotter? Or do you mean like No, I was thinking more like book. plotting system. Like what's your favorite? Like three story method, like save the like cat. three story method, or save the cat, or okay. There's the one that does circles. 
um you know there's the hero's journey the heroine's journey yeah. there's yeah all of those there's the story grid well i like using three story method because it's super easy and and that takes kind of all of the all of the other ones you know i try to line up my manuscript with okay the save the cat moment or the you know dark night of the soul and what's that on my book and does it fit here and what has to come right before and after that and sometimes it gets all convoluted and messy and and nothing like lines up right but three story method is easy (laughs) so you just put the three c's in each of the three acts you know and 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 it doesn't really matter what your structure is if that's in there um that said i really like libby hawker's take off your pants that book mostly because i love the title yeah (laughs) great title but also um yeah when I always tried to use the hero's journey prior to discovering that book. And um, it, again, just didn't ever quite fit. And I kept thinking I was doing things wrong because my books never fit in the hero's journey quite perfectly. So when I heard her, uh, when I read her book, it all seemed to click and I thought, oh yes, this is awesome. So coming up with a flaw for the character at the beginning and then using that to to base your your obstacles mm. against so that by the end of the book the death scene is the death of the flaw mm. which conveniently fits right before or like simultaneous to the global choice nice so i like kind of using a combo of both of those that's very cool i haven't read that book i'm going to have to check that out Sounds it's great. short it's fun. <laughs> Thanks. Tom, do you have one? Um, I, I agree completely with Valerie, um, especially about, and we can get into it deeper, but it's tying the character flaw to the ultimate choice, I think is something that writers always miss. And the book is so much better when, when that's done. But um, my system is the, what I call the five tent pole system, which is basically for panthers or plotters, you got to at least have some idea of these five scenes. And then if you're a real plotter, you can go in and fill in all the scenes in between and you can do a separate sheet for each scene. You can do a spreadsheet, you can do whatever you want. But if you're a pantser, you can just do these scenes and it's going to make your writing way uh, less wasteful and more effective. And they're the ones you think of. It's inciting incident, middle uh crisis choice consequence and, uh, and um and for me i it used to i used to just do the three but i think middle is really important because i keep reading manuscripts that just die in the middle um, <laughs> and it, you have to think about you have to basically think about um the middle should be the point where the character l- literally they call it the mirror moment because the character literally looks in the mirror and says um you know i can't go on this way or they reject that and say everything's fine and then things just get worse but at that point it sort of gives you a pivot to to push figure out your your direction uh my first novel i i actually started with the final image um (laughs) And I just knew that was going to be, it, you know, my final image. And I just made the plot head that direction. And I mean, anytime it strayed too far off, I, I came back. So it was sort of a inciting incident climax. Nice. And those were the only two outline points that I had and everything mm. else. I just sort of just worked your way to did as I went along. Yeah. So it, That's it was, nice. but I, I think that, I mean, some people discovery, right. Or pants for like, 20,000 words and then look at what they have and build an outline out of that. Um, I couldn't do that. I'd feel like I'd be wasting <laughs> or I'd feel tied to what I already had. I'd have a really hard time throwing away. Yeah. Words. I'm an obsessive plotter. I'm sure people <laughs> who listen to this know that I have mm-hmm. spreadsheets upon spreadsheets upon spreadsheets, but yeah, I do. Um, And I've done a different system for every book. Uh, it's actually part of the fun for me of doing a completely different, so I did, I used a 12-act play structure, a 7-act play structure, 
a five act play structure. I use save <laughs> the cat. I've used the story grid method, which I didn't like because there's too many numbers. Um, and I, <laughs> I've used the three story method. My last book, I, I literally started with two posted notes and it was all on character change. And this is actually when I edit, this is what I use. I do a, um, I'll have a, a, like, who is the character going to become and who are they from the front? And I start there. And then I ask myself like, okay, what needs to happen? Like, what do they need to learn? How do they need to change to become the person I want them to be? And then I set up a, I try to find a scene for each of those things where they're forced to learn that and either choose it or not choose it. And that's the, that's, I think I like that method the best, although it does lead, it can, especially if you're writing literary fiction, because I have a lot of clients who write lit fic, it leads to some spiraling plots, like just some like, we're just going to, we're just going to circle this theme for the entire book. Um, and I do find that spiral, well, not a spiral, I guess cascading is the right word. Every literary fiction author I work with has a cascading plot, which is a weird thing where it's like they've got like five conflicts and they wrap them up in a cascading manner where like they wrap up one and then that one leads to the next one and that one leads to the next one and that one leads to the next one. So that's, that's an interesting, I don't know that I found a book that talks about that, but it's well, just something I observed. Yeah, that's interesting because I think it's, it's a Jenny Nash is somebody who has the opposite of that which is that um they should be nested so that the loop mm -hmm. that opens first should be the loop that opens that closes last last yeah and and so uh that you sounds have like one, it would be more satisfying you have one reader one overarching mm -hmm. story plot and then the smaller plots whether it's a romance or whatever they're sort of nestled within it and they they wrap up before the one that you started the book with does. that's interesting is... most of the time they kind of wrap up at random order based on where they start i find with the authors that i work with yeah. like they all kind of start at the beginning and they start to like they kind of randomly wrap up as they i like the nested though i'll have to check that out that's cool I'm trying to think where i where i read that if i figure it out i'll let you know okay Cool. So I'm always jealous of you plotters. Like you guys know what's going to happen, which sounds like it'd be great. Like mm -hmm. I have tried to plot stuff out and the moment I plot it, I no longer will write it or it never sticks to the plot anyway. And I will like, I'll feel like it's actually a hindrance to write to the plot because I can't do any of the, the fun stuff for like me writing the beginning of a book is the worst part of writing for me. I love to write the middle because it's the most fun for mm -hmm. me to write, which is weird. It's just like, that's the playground. You get mm -hmm. to play all of the stuff in the middle that you want or not. But mm -hmm. then of course, I also have the issue of, I have to cut 17 chapters from one of my books. Oh. So. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, have you considered a, sort of what Jeff is talking about a bit, but like an emotional outline? Or just a character outline. In other words, this is this is the what the this is what the major flaw is, and I know at the end of the book that's what the major conflict is going to be. But I don't even have to figure out how it plays out yet. But at least yeah. just knowing that is going to shape how you. How I've you write. tried that before. If anything, the only thing I know is like the vague idea of where the climax should be. So it's like, ooh hey, I've got this one character, because that's usually what pops up in my brain, mm. that or I'll see like a picture of this is the the image of like the street they're going to be on. And I'm like, cool, let me start a book on it. And uh, <laughs> then I'll have an idea of this would be really cool if this happened in the story. And whether or not that is actually the climax is up in the air for me. But that's originally where I'll try to write to. That's so, fine. But you never yeah. know. <laughs> I've I've tried the character thing and I don't know. It it feels like I don't know them enough, which sounds weird. Like I wrote that they, they're in my head, so I should. But I have a book that my characters fell in love with each other behind my back and I was really annoyed about it. <laughs> there's there's also a theory that if your character voices are strong enough, 
you can put two characters together and the plot sort of works itself out. I thought all pantsers, I thought that's the way pantsers worked. Yeah, it's it's like a mixture of that where like you have your characters and they never shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, yeah. do you I use JP's you. story hypothesis thing at all? No. So I've never okay. even like I will try to outline like I even am in the middle of co-writing with someone and we wrote out six chapter outlines because we should have something. And it took me like four weeks to try to figure out how to write it because I'm the first drafter of just chapter one. Mm. And I finally threw the outline out the window, sent him a message and was like, sorry, I just changed everything. And I sent him like three chapters. And I was like, look, I can write if I don't have a plot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I um, I think a lot of it is about what motivates you. Like for me, writing is about solving a puzzle. So I have to have some kind of puzzle pieces to work with. But if I'm just like writing, just free writing, like you're describing, I'm com I'm completely unmotivated. So I think a lot of it has to do with like what motivates you to, yeah. And I guess get the, the words on the page. Yeah. The only system I would follow is whether or not I'm writing it or, or if I'm typing it, and that's mm. like the big difference to my brain. Mm. So if I am writing it on a piece of paper and I'm writing it in a pencil. I'm allowed to throw it out. It's not important. If it gets so written with a if it gets written with a pen, then that's more <laughs> serious and I'm actually thinking through it. Nice. And then if it's typed, that is me like committing to the story. And so now it will be like allowed to take off. So that's amazing. That's I love that. the only system. Here here's something that just solidified in my mind after listening to that, Catherine, which is that for me a pantser is writing the story and then sort of adjusting the outline as they go right because you're you're yeah uh, i mean no they're writing the story and then they're revising it to something that works something that has a skeleton that mm -hmm. that works they're basically imposing an outline on it after it's done yes whereas, so that is that's something i've had issues whereas with. <laughs> what i'm doing is writing an outline probably jeff too i'm writing an outline and then as the story begs to depart i'm editing my outline which is a whole lot fewer words <laughs> yes. and a whole lot easier to change than mm -hmm. ninety thousand words that you've already written so like you know i said i have a i have a inciting incident and a and a finale and I know where I want my midpoint to be but if I'm writing and I think oh this would be way better if this happened then I just rewrite my outline mm -hmm. yeah I've got I've gotten to where I don't even write my outlines anymore I just do them in my head and oh, if I can't say no <laughs> yeah well I do the whole outline and I do the like I'll walk around for like two weeks outlining the story in my head to system but not waste the time to put it down because once I have the outline, I kind of look at it and I'm like, do I actually want to write that? And I've, I've had so many stories that I've outlined in my head and then just thrown away and been like, I don't, I don't want to spend time writing that. But yeah. It's a weird, weird, okay. Sorry. Let's get back on the track. Let's <laughs> sorry, I let us down a really weird we track. Are, sorry about that. We're on track. Yeah. We're on track. Um, Let's talk about, uh, okay, so best stories you've read or seen recently that have a really strong conflict, a really strong choice, a really strong consequence. And the reason I want to I want to do this is because I kind of want to give people a feeling for what we mean by those words. So how are we going to do that without spoilers? Because I have a fantastic Oh, we're going to spoil the crap out of things. Totally yeah. If you don't like spoilers, spoilers, fast forward. No, we're spoiling <laughs> the crap out of everything. Go for it. Plus, so I, I didn't just... hear the recently part, so some of mine are several years old. Oh, it doesn't matter. Recently is subjective. Before you were 14. <laughs> or after you were 14. Well, I just yeah. finished watching um, The English, that limited series on Netflix, I think it is. Ooh, with is Emily that Blunt? Emily Blunt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you were talking about that, Jeff. I'm pointing oh, at you on the screen, but I yeah. love so, it so much. Yeah. Yes. So the choice for me, for her, you know, at the at the end in the last episode, mm. where 
the sheriff has said, you have to leave, you know, this is the way it's going to work. You have to leave and he has to leave and he can never come back. You know, like this is it. This is the only way you will stay alive and out of prison. It's the only way I can make it work. And she's, I'll, I'll not spoiler too much. Like she has nothing to live for according to her. Mm -hmm. And she is willing to be like, fuck it. I'm just going to go and be yeah. with him. And yet she knows that he has some, you know, he can, he has time to live and, and things to live for. So I feel like that is the, what does Jay call it? The best bad choice? Mm -hmm. No, it's the yes. other one. It's the irreconcilable good. Yeah. Where you throw yourself under the bus, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take one for the team. So ultimately she makes a decision and, and it was such a big, horrible decision. Like, you know, do I, it's, it was life or death. Seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point it was about love and maybe dying or, you know, yeah, it just, it yeah, well, it, it represents uh. the choice she's making <laughs> through the whole, like what I love about that moment is she's making these choices through the entire story about who she is mm -hmm. and like what what her life is about and that's kind of the first moment she continues i i felt like through the story she keeps making the same choice which is like i'm going to accomplish this mission over the potential for happiness and family and like I'm going to seek revenge in essence over the potential for happiness and family. And so she keeps making that choice over and over and over again. And then in the end, the, you know, it's a nice completion of like the, the global conflict of like what happens to this woman after this is all over. And it's a nice, like, cause she talks several times in the show about how there is no end after this. This is it. Like she's on this journey and, this is going to end with her dying. And so it, it it's a nice kind of wrap up choice to that overarching conflict, if that makes sense. Yeah. There's so many good things about that show yeah. and I keep picking it apart in my head, but that's not what this episode is about. <laughs> no, it can be though. We can just talk about that. I also like at the end, how of that, I also love in that, like when we're talking about like setting up conflicts that choices and consequences, there's a whole story of a conflict that led to the choices and consequences of the moment that happens before the show starts. Yes. And she was so artful or the writer was so mm -hmm. artful in not info dumping all of this stuff at the beginning. And yeah. that you don't find out like about her son until. I think it's like the second to last episode. You yeah. Finally, she finally like, Hey, here's the conflict choice and consequence that happened that actually set all this in motion. It's great. Yeah. It's a really great. One. Chills. So I, so I, I have one that's almost exactly the same and you're going to laugh when I say it, but it's the last James Bond movie. No time to die. I haven't seen it. Oh, so it spoiler. Yeah. Spoil the crap out of it. Uh, spoil the crap out of it. Um, in it bond. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the past ones, but the, the, one of the characters, one of the female characters comes back and he's, been in love with her for a couple movies etc um at the end he is infected with a dna type nanobot thing that targets particular people by their dna hmm. and so the villain has in, has wow. has infected him with this disease with her dna in it so that if he touches her she will die hmm. and he chooses to stay behind and spoiler everybody he dies at the end of the movie um and lets her go on to live her life he could have escaped he's james bond he could have yeah, he yeah. could have escaped and been with her but he would never have been able to been with her be with her and he didn't want to cheat her out of the rest of her life Interesting. uh and and like you were saying all th all through that movie he is questioning what he's doing in a way that he early james bond never would never does um you know, but the the you can see the the same choice and conflict uh, of 
of sacrifice or you know to, being with someone you love or doing the job for him is sort of the uh, throughout the movie uh, mm. and in the end he has to make it, it, it you know it's a choice it's a it's a no-win choice but uh, very similar to choosing to let somebody live on without you because you think mm -hmm. their life will be better yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's great i just finished anxious anxious people by bachman i finished it in january so it's been a bit but um it was my second read through and it's fascinating it's got nine primary characters maybe 10 which is why i did not read anxious people. oh it's so great it's so great <laughs> and his voices oh his voices are amazing it's such a good right like it's just amazing but all of them are making the choice to care, withdraw into their own needs or care for another person every character is having that conflict like all of their conflicts revolve around are they willing to listen to others and like care for others and it's just it's a beautifully woven story and they all do I, my favorite is there's a well i have several favorite characters in there but there's one specifically um zola i think her name is i may be it starts with a z i may be forgetting i may be messing that up but she is this like ex-banker super wealthy woman who really hates people and her voice is so condescending and dry. It's just great. It's fantastic. And she's, the, we flash back for all of these characters. You flash back into like their normal life outside of like the bank robbery that's going on. And for her, you flash to her conversations with her therapist. And it's just the perfect setup. She's so mean to her therapist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you really see her gradually change over time with this therapist that like by the end of the sessions, she's clearly caring for another person in the, in the bank robbery. It's really great. And he has, a, there's a fantastic conversation between her and that person while he is, he's naked except for his underwear and a rabbit head that he's wearing as they stand on a balcony and she smokes a cigarette. It's fantastic. <laughs> Great conversation. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, a, that was a good, it's got great, great conflicts where they all like push to their edge and then they're all forced to make these choices. Some of the characters make the wrong choice four or five times before they finally like connect with the person they're supposed to connect with. It's really good. That's awesome. Mine is a book I've read uh, last year, and uh, my little sister has it right now, or I probably would have already read it again. Hold on one second. <laughs> the oh, no. fire alarms are going off. Oh, <laughs> bye. We'll come back to you. Uh, uh, I, I've got several. So Yeah, I've got another one too, but go for yeah, it. I've, I've got a list. Um, the um, Well, one is Othello. Hmm. Um, and the the conflict is uh, Othello, who's a deeply emotional, impulsive, and uh, jealous person, is being told by who he thinks is his friend that his wife is cheating on him and being yeah, told by yeah. his wife and being told by his wife that, no, she is not. And he has to choose who to trust. And he, and so that's his choice. And he chooses Iago and the consequences, everybody dies super true in a good shakespeare play the but it's it's a super clear everyone does conflict choice consequence like it yeah. could not be more could not be more clear i love it yeah miss Catherine, which one were you gonna share sorry so it's uh if you tell by greg olson and if you haven't read it it's a psycho book <laughs> um I read it three times in one day, like the day I got it, I was like, yeah, whatever. And it sucks you in. And oh, it's a wow. true story. Um, it's based on the lives of three sisters who are in an extremely abusive household. Like the mom murders people in front of them constantly. Wow. Yeah. 
and it's <laughs> and each sister so like you follow each one as they grow up in this household and they like the choice is literally survival and they like will bury what it used to happen hmm. so like one of them is finally like talking to the grandma and she's like i i think like i watched this happen and this was wrong and the grandma's like what do you mean and she's like mom waterboarded somebody to death in front of us and like we had to make sure that nobody could hear us like the neighbors hmm. like this happening and it's just like such an interesting each sister was like in survival mode completely mm. and it comes to the the youngest sister where the older ones are like hold on we can't let her go through this too and that's that that choice that they finally land up doing when they realize that she's now going through the same thing that they were and awesome. she's like we're watching mom kill somebody again but this time you're the only one left mm. like <laughs> and it was it's so so interesting because there's there's so many times where the characters choose to not help the person that is in the household so like the mom would get like a babysitter and the babysitter would move in but like would then get isolated from anybody and would slowly like be murdered mm. <laughs> but the the sisters would be like no it's it's not us i'm not in the middle of taking that beating so i'm not going to do anything interesting and That's it's fun. such a good story and for a long time they wouldn't tell people their side of the story but the mom's getting out of jail soon so they had the book written as like a warning for nice. other people they're like yeah this is what this woman does <laughs> so definitely recommend it but it's very very detailed in the amount of abuse and how things are killed so it, it like sucks yeah. you in because of it but you're like <laughs> a train wreck and a half to yes. write something through very good awesome. what's the name of it again <laughs> if you tell nice yeah. i liked mexican gothic anybody read that one yeah we did it for a book club a couple months oh, ago for the dialogue you? doctor yeah oh, cool yeah well, i thought she did all three c's great in that book very cool. Yeah, she does the... I'll let you describe them. The conflict was... Um, not Sorry, I was like... about to go off. I I did not like the book, so I was I was about to go off on, like, the three seasons of my version. I was like, no, we're talking positively about the book, so go for oh, it. Oh, I loved the book. I thought it was great. I don't like I don't like gothic horror, so I was a bad audience for the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't generally like horror because I have nightmares and I get mm. easily scared, so um, if you tell, will not be on my reading list. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so normally I don't read horror, but she was coming to our public library and, you know, I we were selling it in the bookstore so i just wanted to read it you know before she came mm -hmm. and um and it was very atmospheric so it was kind of a slow it was creepy but not like horrific and so the conflict was just a simple but classic like a letter arrives in the mail and you know that starts i have to go and you know see what's going on with my cousin and the choice I thought was a little bit, a little bit murky, but not really. I mean, it was kind of, she had to make the choice. She made the choice to live. And so all of the choices that she made from that point on were in service to that. So however she could yeah. get out of the house alive was kind of all and part she, of the she choice. She keeps choosing to stay at the same time. She keeps, she's, they keep because offering she, her for the ability to leave. And she's like, no, I'm going to stay for my cousin. Yeah. 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 And so, so, and, and also the other, the other cousin, I guess the, the one that's her age. Yeah. That's the one man. I was talking about. Oh, the man. Yeah. Yeah. She, I guess she kind of chooses to stay for him. I mean, she's actively and aggressively choosing to stay for the cousin that's sick. For yes. her older cousin that's sick. But She's then like, stay. leaving at the, you know, at the end of the book, when mm -hmm. she does leave the house, she makes the choice to, you know, bring him with her. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, and so the consequence, what I really liked about the consequence in that novel was that it was it was that it was the perfect, 
expected and not expected consequence. Like you knew it was going to happen, but not exactly how. And so it was inevitable that it happened, but it was artfully written so that it wasn't like a, oh, I saw that coming. Just, I don't know how to describe that. I just thought yeah, the it, it was, it <laughs> was a consequence. You know, from the very, like, I'd say from like chapter two, you're like, oh, there's a monster in the house. Like, there's not a clear, you're like, oh yeah, there's a monster in this house. But the question is like, who is the monster? What is the monster? And so they, and that's they, the horror she part. rolls it out. Yeah, that's the horror part. She rolls it out slow. But it's that like, you know, the consequence of like, there's a monster in the house and I'm going to have to face it is very clear through that. But that's, yeah, again, that's part of the genre. It is, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, any other, any other thoughts on I don't think I shared that book club on the podcast. I think that was just a dialogue or discussion. I don't remember. No, you did because I wasn't there for that one, and I remember. Did I? Okay, listening to it. Okay. Um, I may have put it in the Patreon though. I don't think no. I put it on the free podcast. I don't know. Um, all right. Any others that stick out to you? I, oh, yeah. I will. I will say I have. I I've been watching the fourth season of You, which I'm not going to spoil because. Sarah Gamble wrote it, and after she wrote The Magicians, I will I will show for anything she does. Um, I, <laughs> when it comes to conflict choice and consequences, it's an interesting example because the conflict's always very weak because you know he's a serial killer that stalks people, so the conflict is always like I'm in love with this, I'm obsessed with this woman, and something is standing in our way like that's it's and it usually is like within the first 30 seconds you're like oh there's the conflict um and the consequence is always like the closing consequence is going to be you know from the beginning of the first episode he gonna kill this woman like that's the like that's where this is going what's fast what keeps me engaged are his choices are so fascinating because the character voice is so good because he's such a weird mix of like intense self-confidence and arrogance but they're just really dumb like he's just he makes the worst decisions so it's it i find it very comedic and um a fascinating story but it's one of those where like two of the elements are really weak but the the middle one's really strong yeah so uh one of my all-time favorites is Gone Baby Gone by Dennis Lehane. Oh, yeah. Which they made a movie out of. But yeah. the book is even more devastating uh, because it's book four and you've seen these, you've seen the two protagonists grow and come together uh, over three books. Uh, and again, spoilers, but uh, Gone Baby Gone, they're two detectives, a, a boyfriend and girlfriend, they're a romantic couple. Um, and they're hired by um they are hired to find a missing child uh and the child is missing from the very worst parts of boston um and has a mother who is the very sort of pinnacle of white trash and when they find the child the child is, is in a much better situation and the choice that the they have to make is do they follow the law and return this child to its mother or do they leave the child where it is in the in the better situation and one of them makes one choice and one of them makes the opposite one of them wants to make the opposite choice but but isn't able to and the consequence is that their relationship is destroyed and it just killed me killed me and it's what and the movie I I can't remember the last time I saw a movie where people were on the sidewalk discussing it after the movie. Oh, wow. People were outside like discussing like yeah. I totally would have done that. I wouldn't have done that. Like it was you know mm -hmm. I'm sure if you went online there are people who are are you know on on either side of it. Um, I was obsessed. I I watched the movie and was obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. And what would you have yeah. done? I don't know. So I mean, a fantastic example. Yeah. Uh, very, very clear. Conflict yeah. choice and consequence. Uh, two TV shows that I recommend because almost because every episode has the three C's. One is Squid Game. Yeah. Uh, there's especially the episode where they're playing the game with the dimes. 
Do you know the one I mean? So they've had several episodes in a row where there are teams. If you're unfamiliar with Squid Game, it's like these people who are who are coerced into playing these games and and people die. Oh, it's a murder are, game. It's yeah, murder the, game. The, the I don't know why they based, call it Squid Game. It should have been called Murder Game. The games yeah. are all based on these childhood games. Um, but they they totally uh they totally sucker punch you by having several games in a row where there are teams. And so the good characters are, are working together and they get by. And so for the next game, they are told to pair up. And so the, the main character pairs with this old guy who's been on his team the whole time. And then it turns out that for that challenge, the two people are going to face each other and only one of them is going to live. And it is just crushing because basically the main character realizes that he can fairly easily cheat the old man and win Mm -hmm. um, and has to decide what to do. And then the other, the other TV show is dead to me. I haven't Have seen that Dead to Me. Oh my God, Jeff, you gotta watch Dead to Me. I haven't watched it's, that. So, it it gets a little ridiculous because the because they play up the conflict so much, like the cliff. Every episode cliffhangers, and I mean, it's just like it's just crazy, but it's really well done. Nice. Uh, I will check that I, out. I definitely recommend it. And then the very last, the last one I had was. Um, uh, the Dark Knight, the movie, is all conflict all the way through. He purpose it's all best bad choice over and over again. Yeah. There's the you know, there's several times where Batman has to decide whether to kill the just straight out kill the Joker or not. There's the thing with the two fairies where the cr- criminals are on one mm-hmm. fairy and the citizens are on the other. Uh, there's the t- choice to whether he saves Harvey Dent or saves his girlfriend. Yeah. And at the end, he has to choose to be thought of as a criminal instead of a hero because it's for the good of the city so mm-hmm. that, i mean that entire movie is just yeah he's choice setting, set up after choice setup the joker is such a great like chaos agent in that movie too because he's setting up choices not just for batman but for all of the characters there's a yeah. my yeah. favorite conversation in that movie is between him and the character that has just become two-face in the hospital where the joker's lying through his teeth but literally telling them like i didn't do any of this do i look like a, his the great line do i look like the kind of guy who makes plans like it's so <laughs> great but yeah that that movie was way better than it had any right to be oh okay. yeah it was it was fantastic yeah okay so you're a writer you're writing a story um how do you know what is a sign that your global three c's are broken it's not interesting. Okay, that's fair. Describe not interesting. Um, I often struggle with the global choice when I write because I already know what the character is going to do because I've plotted it out. So I don't know how sometimes to create that tension, that internal um dichotomy i guess you know the war that's happening inside for the character and make that believable and lengthy enough and have enough tension to create the the indecision in the reader like so the reader doesn't know what the person's going to choose mm. or i'll or i'll make um I'll write in the global choice and it's too obvious. Like, of course they're going to pick that. Right. That's a big one. So that's hard. That's the hard part for me. And so my global choices are often broken and I have to really work hard to, to create something that that's evil and worse, you know, not Mm. evil, but like to make it hard to make that decision. That's a that's a good that's a good note. Yeah. For me, I don't write one, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> or like I don't I don't consciously think of it while I write the book. So once it's finished, I will go back and make sure that what I wanted to say was there. <laughs> so I guess the, the the three C's are there, and I guess for me, it's 
a lot of it's more e internal because I deal with a lot of the dark side of humanity and whether or not you should stop the stuff that you see going on. So like my steampunk is all about the rape culture. So for that, it's very, they start off trying to find one person to realize there's thousands missing. And do I just keep looking for the one person or do I shut down an entire organization? Mm -hmm. So like for me, it really builds on, I've written it. Now, how do I make that conflict like more painful? <laughs> So it's how just like upping the emotions of the yeah. conflict, yeah. So that's how I go about doing it. If, if it's falling flat for me and it's not enough, like your character is not feeling it enough, then I know that there's something wrong and mm -hmm. I've got to I've got to make it worse <laughs> for them. Yeah. Tom, do you have one? Yeah, several or more. I always yes, I, yeah. what what is I always tell people that um to make it bigger uh mm. pe people underestimate how how much disbelief readers will suspend and so i often find uh, someone's first draft that the that the finale is boring like it's mm. too 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 pedestrian or over over too quickly and then sometimes even if it's huge and flashy it's boring because they haven't connected the character flaw to the finale so mm -hmm. they have a plot where the character is um you know overcoming their fear of commitment but the climax is you know diffusing a bomb that has nothing to do with their fear of commitment yes yeah. um the um i have a handy little um handy little adage that whenever i give it to an author they're like that doesn't make any sense but um you want and i i really think you need to have you know what your climax is at least emotionally because mm -hmm. it has to connect directly to your character um uh and it, but in addition to that your character should be the best and the worst person to handle that conflict mm -hmm. so uh at the same time so an example perfect example is frodo so Who's the best person to destroy the ring? A person pure of heart. Mm -hmm. Who's the worst person to go on a thousand mile long journey through the wilderness to destroy the ring? A hobbit who doesn't like to leave his house. Mm -hmm. Hunger Games is the same way. Who's the best to survive? A huntress. But when she gets to the capital, it's all politics. And she's horrible at politics. Uh, and she's also fiercely loyal. So who's the best to survive in a game where you have to kill everybody else? she's not going to do as well. So uh, I like that. I'm writing that down. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it, um, and you see it in, I mean, you sort of see it naturally in movies and stuff and don't quite, you know, don't quite realize what's going on there, but, but tying, tying the character's flaw to what happens in the finale, uh, or you said very early on Valerie, like that's where the, the death of the, the death of the flaw is the, is the choice um and then also making that person the the best and the worst person for it uh you'll see some people say that make it the protagonist the only person that can solve the problem which i'm not sure i agree with but they definitely have <laughs> yeah but they have they definitely have to be the ones who are doing the action uh i will get i i get a ton of books where something happens to the character that solves all the problems and it's like, no, the character has to make the choices that are causing and solving the problems. Yeah, that's that's one of the first signs I always find in in books and in my own work is if the character's passive and like things are just happening to them or around them and they're like on a journey through this conflict. It's like, oh, yeah, there's no there's no choices being made here. They're just like floating through the world. Like all of this would have resolved even if they hadn't have been there. They just happened to be a witness <laughs> to it. And I I have had writers explain to me that no, that's okay. And I'm like, it's not okay. <laughs> Indiana Jones, one of those? <laughs> no, well, that's he's it. very interesting though. In the first Indiana Jones, he he doesn't solve anything. No. <laughs> no, he doesn't. 
but he does make a lot of choices that actually yeah. make his situation worse. But <laughs> at the end, he but at the end, he makes a choice to um, to not look, mm-hmm. which is a pretty big choice for him because curiosity is like yeah, because he's looked at everything so far. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And it does tie directly to his character, which is part of what, you know, he's actually going to, he's going to, and he surrenders the artifact at the end and has it like wrapped up and hidden away, which is his, you know, not what he wants to do. Um, Some good advice that I've heard repeatedly um, is to not use your first idea, like regarding the global choice, for instance. mm -hmm. And, and I, find that hard also to take (laughs) that advice but yeah I think that that would help because my first idea is obviously going to be the reader's first idea too or Mm -hmm. you know similar like if they start the book and think oh well that's what's going to happen and then it does then that's boring and you've kind of cheated your reader out of an experience Mm -hmm. so trying to come up with other things other ideas and not using your first one yeah. might I agree. be a way to fix that broken bit i totally agree with that uh and i think but i think it's okay to use that first idea in your outline to get yourself going yes and then at you know when you're editing or as you approach that finale be like how how could this be bigger or better yeah i typically don't find the idea that i'm going to make the final choice or conflict until i'm like thirty thousand words in and then it's like oh no this is how this ends it happens to me every time nice i still change my endings i'm on draft Mm -hmm. four (laughs) yeah Uh, it's like oh this is how this goes um the other one i find that the other sign that like your three c's are broken is when (laughs) you have a bunch of chapters where what you as the writer find interesting about it is the information that's being conveyed. That happens a lot, especially when I'm working with like historical fiction authors, which I've worked with many. And it's always like, yeah, these characters here are having a conversation about, you know, the, the Spanish revolution and how it led to the inquisition. And I'm like, well, what does that have to do with your story? Well, no, but they're you know, like, it's really historical and they're using historical language and it's really like, you know, it's a moment in time. And I'm like, nobody wants to read that. Like, so it's not like, you know, like that's not true. Like some people may really enjoy reading this moment in time, but if it doesn't have, if that's how, if that's what's driving your book is like, look at how well I represented the time period or look at how well I represented this fantasy world or look at how, how great my description of the battle scene between the orc and the, the orc army and the knight's army are, but there's no like, you know, real choices that a character we love and follow are making then it's it's a broken it's broken three c's i find one where it's um because i'm really about characters like that's how i write i feel my characters i have music playlists that are designed per character for whatever it is they're doing Mm -hmm. so like if i have a romance between two characters i have their whole playlist if i have she's being a badass i have her whole playlist for that so for me it's if your choices don't add up to changing your character then there's something wrong so either you're trying to like i think we talked about this once with like jack reacher you're trying to get the character from being monotone to experiencing stuff to back to monotone Mm -hmm. so like no matter how you're like from the start to the end the choices should change the character in that direction and if it's not then there's there's something wrong with the story i think so like that's the way that i i find stuff so if my character's choices aren't making any growth in any direction then there's something wrong yeah i think the question is like just to elaborate on what you're saying the question is like are there forks in the road like are there forks where the character could go this way or that way based on what they're going to do and then like when it's the global you're thinking about the global story like what is the what the what's the fork that keeps represent re, re 
presenting itself, like presenting itself over and over again, that in that ideally the character is going to make the 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 best choice in the climax. If it's a positively ending story, if it's a tragedy like Othello, he makes the worst choice in the climax. <laughs> Everybody dies, right? Like, but it's that. Where's the forks? Where are the forks in the road? Yeah, which um, we haven't talked about theme, but I think theme connects to that too. Um, put it, you want you want to add conflict. You want those forks to connect to your theme and not just be random forks. Yeah, or like Catherine saying, they have to the choices should lead them where you want them to go. Uh, Valerie was saying about worrying that the plot would uh, that the uh, once she knew what the finale was, she sort of got bored with it. Uh, or I was worried that the reader would get bored with it. And another nice trick that I like is one that I call old tools and new tools. Because I worked for a blacksmith once. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I haven't said that in like four months. I know. <laughs> um, you killed me on the podcast today, though, when you were talking about uh, using Dr. Lingo and then being like, I'm never saying that again. Let's pretend I never said that. I don't even remember what I you, said. I know you said like, the, you didn't say the doctor's in or, but you said like, I can't remember what you said, but oh, it was God. some doctor phrase and you're like, no, no. I've work. blocked it from my mind. Um, so <laughs> It's gone forever. One of, one of the good uses of the midpoint, especially, this is especially great for Hero's Journey. Uh, so one of the good point, good uh, things for, for the midpoint is the character realizes that they realize what the change they have to make is so they actually they actually become cognizant of their flaw and then they spend the third quarter of the story trying to fix the flaw using all the tools that they've always used and it does not work and it's not until the final conflict where if they do not use the new tools that the mentor or the loved one or whoever it is has been telling them right along that they're missing if they don't embrace a, a new philosophy then they will fail and of course in a in a in a happy ending they figure it out and in a in a sad ending. no you see that in in the marvel movies a lot yeah uh, I, I love where they get their powers that's great know, they get their powers in the middle and they start like oh i can solve every problem now but they haven't fixed the the underlying character, character flaw yeah yeah i think the best example that comes to mind right now is the lucifer tv show on netflix that is that show in a nutshell yeah. him constantly trying to solve his character flaws using his own tools and complete and knowing the flaw and completely failing to solve it because he refuses to learn new tools yeah it's a really good way to show growth oh, in a character i love that language that's i'm totally stealing that another um, idea is um, larry brooks is story engineering i don't know this is another structure but he uses a four act structure so mm -hmm. the acts two and three are just the second act that's really big mm -hmm. but in act two like tom you were saying so he calls it the act two is the the hero is the in the wanderer like position and then in act three he's in the warrior position so he's kind of stumbling through wandering through trying to figure out what's why everything's mm -hmm. going wrong and then at that midpoint realizes oh i know what i need to do and then he uses those new tools to try to figure out you know now he's the warrior and now he can go out and try to figure out how to use those new tools and and then in act four, which is normally act three, yeah. <laughs> the other stuff happens. But I kind of liked that um, segregation of that giant act two that does tend to sag a little bit in the, in the middle. And it helped to like um, segregate it in, in those two different um, character arc ways. I like that a lot. Yeah. I couldn't use it for more than one book though, because then I get bored. I have to change every book. But I really, <laughs> I really like that idea. You really try pantsing one sometimes. See how that works for you. I've tried. I can't get through the first chapter. I'm so lost. <laughs> first chapter? Yeah, wow. I can't. I can't even. I'll write like because the minute I start to write the first chapter, I'm like starting to outline. And so, so I can't it. You do like the pantsing does sort of outline. Like you, you get ideas and you see where stuff is going. You just. 
Yeah, but you don't it start a spreadsheet like I do. <laughs> 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 you don't start laying out the spreadsheet like I do. That's the problem. Um, that's my problem. That's my own neuroses. Uh, yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Um, we've covered a massive amount of stuff. Uh, let's do a final thought. There's a writer listening to this who's like, oh, crap. My story's broken. Give us a, uh, a, a a word of encouragement to that writer. That's what editing's for. I was yes, going to say the same thing. Nice. Everything's fixable. I mean, <laughs> I'm on draft four, and then I finally sent it out to someone. Like, I have an entire plot hole in one of my books that I forgot to write in the villain until the climax. Mm. Um, <laughs> he was in my head the characters reacted to a nobody that was there it made no sense until mm. my alpha reader noticed but that's what the editing is for <laughs> like you'll go back through and be like "Ooh, okay but you have to write it in order to know what you're missing yeah i would say have the spine have those those five things and have them all relate to the character flaw uh and one thing we didn't talk about, but um, make it relate to the character flaw and also uh, make the choice um, something that will change the character forever. Nice. The, the choice is not like, which stranger do I save, right? It's, do I save, which child do I save? Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I, I tell writers who are nervous about their story and stuck what was it that you loved about the original idea mm. use that to fix it whatever because so much of writing is finding motivation to like plow through the difficult stuff of working on the book so like what was it about the original idea that was motivating you to start this thing and then I'm writing let's, that down. let's go from there <laughs> um valerie you want the final word um oh that makes it sound way more important than i <laughs> it has to be one tom's gonna write down <laughs> it's a combo <laughs> it's a combo of when i do a story diagnostic for someone it's just a checklist of things that you go through in your subsequent editing passes so everything's fixable it's just an item on the checklist and you can address things one at a time and it doesn't have to be scary and oh my god i've got to rewrite the whole thing mm. you know just and then also like an addendum to that i guess is using the story hypothesis in kind of the same way you just said about you know like what's the core message of this story and am i proving it or disproving it mm. through the course of the book and i think the way to to really make that pop for the reader is to focus on the character and and that character journey mm. so that's basically nice. what everybody else said <laughs> no that's that that nice that's good um all right well thanks y'all for coming on thank uh, you I will so much fun your, thank you yeah i really appreciate it i will drop your i love i love these times where we just get to sit and talk um it's great uh, I will drop uh, all of the links in the show notes. So um, come find these amazing three editors because they're incredible. And you can tell that they are wise beyond uh, me and most of us listening. So come find them and work with them. All right, I'm going to hit stop and uh, we can talk a little bit more. Okay.